Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the team behind the film Pretty Problems. We are joined today by Kestrin Pantera, who is the director, uh, JJ Nolan, mm-hmm. who plays Cat in the film, Michael Tennant, who plays Jack in the film and is also a writer and producer, and Britt Rentschler, who plays Lindsay and also has story by credit and is a producer. Um, you know, and because, you know, it sounds like you've all been really heavily involved in this film at several stages during the development of the story and the narrative and these characters as well, I was actually really interested in kind of what the early conversations within this collaboration were in terms of figuring out the most important story beats or the character details that were most important to then start fleshing out and filling in a lot of the details in between. Uh, that's, well, a, I, that's a Brit answer. That's a Brit answer and a Kestrin answer. Well, I can kind of start off to say that I inherited a script that was in incredible shape and form and that, I mean, it was an endless process of talking to the actors once they were on board of distilling it down and taking every character and every relationship down to the studs so that we were really clear through the three act structure like did we have a movie um and as far as the initial inspiration and the fleshing out of the characters um from the genesis before my time um that is a staunch brit uh question to answer (laughs) i got this amazing call from michael and he was like listen I just reread Brene Brown's Daring Greatly and I got this idea and I'm really nervous about it, but like, you know, screw it. I'm going to send you the scripts. Just tell me what you think. And he had the first 10 pages written. He basically had Jack and Lindsay, you know, kind of from the start and then getting up to um, Sonoma. So it was like, here we are, these, these first 10 pages, does it grab you? Let's see what's going on. And I took it to a coffee shop, read it, immediately called him and was like, this is a movie. This is it. Like you have it. I'm grabbed. I want to do this. The answer is yes. Let's go right now. And he's like, okay, uh, come over to my house. And so we sat in his backyard and he told me his idea, you know, he wanted to make it a weekend, kind of like a rabbit hole situation. And, and then we just got a bottle of rosé and and started talking about what the itinerary should be for every day. And what are the wildest, craziest things that we could think of to put these people through and finished, you know, uh, kind of beating out the rest of the of the script in terms of the acts. And then yeah. that's that's how it was born. And then Michael typed away and would come back with pages and pages and pages. And we'd go through it and we'd edit it and we'd text each other in the middle of the night. And we kind of came up with this, um, you know, thing that was, it was done, but it wasn't done, but it was done. And then and then we brought it to Kestrin and luckily she had the same reaction that I did once all the pages were finished. So. Yeah, no, I really love that, you know, and, and for you, Michael, as well, kind of in writing the script and then playing this character, he's in such a space of where he wants to be in, in his life is at such polar opposites to where he envisioned himself being. And that's where some of the cracks in the relationship start coming through as well. And so in shaping your performance in the film, but also having written the script, how did you really want to shape that out to be such an internalized and externalized aspect of your character? Um, I, I, I just, there's a thing about potential with human beings and in relationships specifically where I, I think we, you know, we fall in love with someone and there's this idea of, um, like there's, there's pheromones, there's whatever, there's chemistry, but, um, we fall in love with potential. We fall in love with the idea of who this person can be and who can I be with this person and who can we be together? And, I, in my own relationship at that point, was starting to feel like we may have hit the ceiling of what that may have been. Uh, I was talking with a lot of friends, Brit included, um, but um, uh, a lot of my friends about like, okay, I guess, so this is it. This is what we're doing. And I I kind of started basing the narrative in Jack specifically around, you know, I think the difference between Jack and I is that Jack... Um, Jack falls down and isn't able to pick himself back up. And he kind of just stays where he's at and he just gets angry about it. I'm somebody who gets really curious about things when I don't understand them. Um, I like, you know, I, I, when I don't understand something, I need to figure it out and I get real curious and I wanted to just have a really fun movie that also kind of hurt a little bit. And I wanted to just explore what relationships were and what does this mean if we, you know, I also think we put privilege on such a pedestal and I think we put money on such a pedestal um so I just wanted to tell a fun story around a marriage that was not going great but that also the people at the end of the movie you know 
want to trust one another and 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 agree to try again i think yeah that was rambling i apologize i mean i kind of to your question about michael's performance i felt like he 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 transformed or i witnessed him transform from a writer who had a really powerful vision and a really specific and clear vision and ultimately had to really surrender to being an actor and, and it was like two, like a split personality. Like he had to like give up a lot and he did such a, I was very impressed with uh, the vulnerability that he ultimately um, gave us in the film. And it is a different person. Like Jack is a completely different person from Michael Tennant. And um, I think, yeah, I, I was, it was a joy to, to chip away and, and kind of watch that uh, spirit. Kestrin come had out of to him. pull me aside one day and tell me to stop <laughs> tying everyone's shoes on set. She was like, you just need to, to uh, you also, and uh, Kestrin uh, is such a genius, but um, Kestrin had to pull me aside and be like, you need to stop tying everyone's shoes. She's like, you're doing too much. Like just concentrate on your just concentrate on being jack and it really opened it up for me in such a in really lovely way yeah i also kind of love that description of the story being you know these characters i think you could describe any of them as there's their story being something that's very comedic but also hurts a little bit and so jj wanted to talk about your character cat because it's interesting to kind of watch it and rewatch some of the scenes in your performance and try to figure out how self-aware is she at various points in the story, because later on in the film, she has a lot of self-awareness, but there's moments where it feels like she has none, but it also feels like you're playing to that space in between most of the time. And so I was really curious how you saw her relationship with that dynamic within herself. Um, well, she's a mess. Um, and she, <laughs> Um, I kind of, I kind of wanted her to be like a, a mystery um, throughout, like, because she doesn't really know who she is. She didn't take the time to to find herself. She just married into money, and chose that life for herself. Um, so yeah, there's she's got a lot of demons, um, and she's just like constantly trying to suppress them. Um, but Michael's note to me going into it was, I want her to start as Beyonce. And and as coked out Jack Nicholson, <laughs> so finding the the journey that made the journey so much more fun because I'm like oh I could like like she she comes in as Beyonce and like Brit's character wants to be me and throughout the movie she like has so much like but then she starts to kind of the you start to see the, the, the crack in the veneer and the, and the drugs are start. She has actually no idea what the fuck is going on ever. Am I allowed to cuss? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fuck yeah. Let's go. Fuck yeah. yeah. Fucking internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say you're correct. Um, and that she, 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 you don't see a lot of self-awareness until the end, but she wants to come across as, um, a very you know a, a, a star um and like somebody that people should praise and aspirational uh, yeah which is, aspirational. yeah what was so amazing about JJ's performance is you know she came into this and took over this monumental character that we had put we had put on a pedestal in terms of like who would you idolize? Who would you want to be? What would they say to make you want this? And also speaking to what Michael said about feeling so stuck in your own relationships or in your own world, which I think the script really grew over quarantine. We had to put off our shoot because of COVID. But in that time, even more, like when you're locked in your own fucking house day after day with the same people, it's like, what do you want to escape to? What are these vacation talk conversations that we have where we're like, it's going to be different. We're going to change. We're going to do all these things. And how do we find a person who can three-dimensionally bring that across and want to suck you in, but then also ends up having so much more texture underneath of her own hurt, her own worry, her own sorrows that, that this money does not actually solve. You know, you can put her in a different house with a different partner and it's still going to be the same story. And JJ did such a remarkable job of that, of, of going from that really glossy aspirational person into this really like just as yucky as you feel on the inside is how she feels no matter what she looks like on the outside, you know? Yeah. Thank you. 
yeah, she's kind of a, yeah, she's got a lot of monsters. She is a monster kind of, but she's very vulnerable and, and just like has no idea who she is. I loved her. No, she's, she's a great character to watch with your performance. Okay. And Kestrin, Kestrin, I was interested in from, from a directing standpoint, you know, the, the journey of not just finding the location because it's such a central part of the film and it really is about taking this space which represents these characters, represents their life, but then also how you wanted to, with the camera, approach filming in the space because when you watch the film, it feels like, okay, you know, Cat and Matt have bought these friends into this house, but it feels completely interchangeable. It feels like this is their life every week and the people that they bring in, that's the, that's the recycled part that changes every week, every month, every few weeks. Um, and so how did you want to film it within the location to really capture that essence of we're seeing this for the first time, but this isn't the first time that all of this has happened. Well, I love that your comment was that they cycled through these people, these visitors. And one of the really early conversations we had on was who is the protagonist? Whoever watches the movie, if you're a guy, you often think that it's Jack. Or if, you, if depending on where you are in the country from, some people identify with Jack and others identify with Linz. So we really had, it took a long time to just be like, okay, we're following Linz. It's Linz. Um, and presenting the world through Lindsay's eyes was the first decision that we made with the DP. Cause there was a lot of ways it could have gone. And that when Jack and Lindsay are together in their room, that it is a, a cage where they are trapped and they are not free. And that it is a cold place where they are forced to reckon with their demons. And once they go outside of their safe prison chamber, into this beautiful aspiration of world. It's almost like Wizard of Oz, like Dorothy steps in and it's color and there's, you know, karaoke and there's rave discos and there's ecstasy and it's so awesome. And then there's flowers and then there's like hot air balloons just soaring past and it's this otherworldly delight. And that was really the premise uh, or that was the foundational thought behind um, you know, how, how we approached filming. I'm on set right now. Actually, I'm in a trailer. So if you hear jiggling or pounding, that's, uh, it's just, that's the deal. So I just thought there was an earthquake <laughs> happening. Though. Yeah. Know, people, like, yeah, great. there's some movement and there's some work happening, but it's just all good. speaks to the many talented, uh, <laughs> Kestrin's ability to multitask at all times. <laughs> Exactly. And then, you know, Brett, kind of going back to your character and with Lindsay, it's she's in this space at the beginning when she first meets Kat and she's just so enamored with her so quickly and so easily. And even when Kat compliments her, you can see that it's a struggle for her to accept that compliment, which tells us so much about even outside of her relationship, the relationship that she's having and that journey within herself. Um, and I love the fact that it's like actually she kind of starts to pull away on the weekend back towards Jack is when she kind of refines that self worth that she's been looking for. And so what was that inner trajectory that you wanted to really find for her in that way? And for you, where did that turning point come of like starting to see things differently as opposed to just being very enamored with this person that offers an idea of a life that maybe she's interested in? Yeah, that that is, um, I have to tell you, when we first started working on the script, I was originally very drawn to Kat um, because of the chaos. And I thought it would be so fun to do. But then I realized that the bigger challenge truly would be for me to play Lindsay because I was going to be forced to look at the yuckiest parts of myself, yeah. those parts that you really don't want other people to see, the parts that want and yearn and compare and feel like you're, there's just such a lack of self-worth in it. And I think we can all relate to it. And especially I, I would grew up in Alabama and, you know, being a woman in the South was very, I had wonderful parents and wonderful people around me, but the actual culture is so, it's so suffocating for women. You are supposed to be smaller. You are supposed to be quiet. You're supposed to, your, your worth is in pleasing people. And that's the part that I pulled from Lindsay was that she, you know, she works in service. She has a vision as a designer, but she can't communicate it or get it together. You know, the grief of her mother dying, she dropped out of school. Would she have dropped out of school anyway? Maybe, you know, I think it was really hard for her to believe that she could have a voice as big as how she sees cats. And then, so for me, it was easy. It was like the spell was right there. When you are that vulnerable to your own negative thoughts, 
if someone comes by and offers you a piece of cotton candy, it's like your eyes get so big so fast and you're like, sure, I'll follow you. I'll follow you to the better place, you know? Um, so that transition was really, it was hard to live through it because I've been in those places where I've been around people who have wealth and think I'm so small, you know? Um, and I think that's what Lindsay had to figure out. And for me, the first crack, the first real crack was when there was a moment where she's waking up and she's walking outside and she goes to this person who she is just so dying to accept as her new best friend and says, you know, I want to talk about what happened last night because Kat betrays one of her secrets. And Kat's answer is like, yeah, that didn't have to happen. You didn't have to tell me about it. And I think that's the first time that Lindsay's like, oh, wait a second. I thought you were my friend. I thought I could talk to you. And, and then it kind of starts to tumble downhill from there. Um, and look, it does bring her back to Jack, but I think what it really brings her back to is making a decision for herself and having to start to own that every decision is hers and that moving forward, we don't know what's going to happen with their relationship, but she is aware of the fact that it has to be her choice and she has to go start looking these things in the face. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of leads me back to you, Michael, as well, because, you know, Jack's going through this whole kind of push and pull where he's trying to let himself enjoy the moment for, you know, and trying to work on his relationship. And yet there's that nagging voice that, you know, he constantly says out loud, like at first when he's like, I think they're going to murder us. This seems like a terrible idea. Why would we go do this? <laughs> you know, and he's the person calling out all of the red flags. And um, I was actually interested in if you saw him as kind of the inner voice that the audience has, because there's moments where in watching it, you're like, I don't know if this is a good idea. Something seems a little fishy with this, um, you know, oh, now it seems like they're having fun. They're doing karaoke, you know, it's like he allows himself to kind of let loose at certain moments, but then something always snaps him out of it and pulls him back. And so did you see that as kind of the inner voice for the audience to have as well? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, long answer. Um, the, the original title for this movie was Pretty Problems, in parentheses, Murder House. And... <laughs> The, the whole idea was we had this whole subplot that we ended up cutting. Thank God, Kester and I love you. Um, where Jack is just like Jack's having hallucinations. Like he just thinks he's like he's like running through vineyards and there's people chasing him. And it was just like, you know, we're not making a horror movie. And people weren't kind of getting like again, again, all credit to Kester on this. It was like, we don't need this. Cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. Um uh I just, I, I, I did see, I think Brittany just said this really beautifully. Um, we just wanted a movie where I want people to, I want people to side with Linz and I want them to side with Jack at the same time. Like, because that's what we do in relationships, right? We, we, we vacillate between these two things on the spectrum and we all want things. We're all aspirational, right? Like we're on the zoom call right now because we're going to South by Southwest, which is an awesome way to go team. But like, <laughs> but like, we're all aspirational. We want things, right? Um, but there also is this this point in the middle that I, you know, I hope most people can find in their relationships of like, this is where we converge. Like, this is where the fun stuff happens. This is where we meet. But we need to have these things on the side. The difference with Jack and Lynn is that Lynn's wants things so hard. And Jack is just kind of like, it didn't work, and I'm over it. And I'm a nihilist, and nothing is real. And JJ and I had texts <laughs> to each other all the time where it's like, nothing is real. We don't care. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, yeah. So yes, that's exactly what I was going for. Great, great, great work. You got it. <laughs> Kester and I also wanted to ask you about the the costumes in the film and kind of how those came together because they're such great representations of these characters you know who Kat's projecting to be within her marriage you know you've got the the couple with the very similar names kind of with a real likeness and then you know you've got who Lindsay is at the beginning of the film and then who she's trying to be around these people and who she thinks she needs to dress like um you know before she kind of finds her way back and then Jack's just kind of always Jack there in the middle as well um just and Jack. so I was really interested <laughs> I was always interested in the journey that the costumes took in terms of those that development fucking and collaboration. cargo shorts those yeah fucking cargo shorts those fucking yeah. cargo shorts. Michael's still mad about the pants but you know this was kind of for as this was a lesson that true growth only happens when you master the art of delegating. And this was an instance where 
costume design was fully delegated to one of the most capable people in the entire, an extremely capable woman who has styled of many people. And we were very fortunate through JJ's recommendation, a stylist she had worked for, um, Melissa came on board and took the task to town and made it her passion and vision. And she thought so deeply about each character, more deeply than anyone I've ever seen really plunge into the it, like the, the the unconscious psyche of each of these people and then delivered these options. And it was such joy because I love clothes. I love fashion. And she would just whip out these really intense backstories for each person based on the designer, based on the shoe, based on the, you know, accoutrement, the accessories, whatever. And, um, you know, she had Victor and Rolf for the wine tasting scene and where JJ looked like the mayor of Candyland, but also really high fashion. And it was just super, um, she was, it was bonkers, you know? So that was, that was Melissa's art and, and she gets complete credit for that stylist melissa lynn what is her instagram what's her full Mel, yes let's say what would her i'm i'm wait wait I'm, let's get it clean let's get it let's clean JJ. Get it clean. do it clean oh i was gonna say for the record i never worked for melissa but with I, her no 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 she worked with you oh i thought you said i worked for her <laughs> no you did not work no you, no you worked together she worked yeah, with yeah, you as yeah. a stylist yeah. Yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 and wait, say your name clean, our style, our, our, our costume designer. Give it from the top. Melissa Lynn Woodbury. Was our costume designer and she's a master. Yes. Yeah. May, I, may I just jump in real quick? The, yeah. uh, JJ and I were in class, in acting class together years ago. Um, some, one of my favorite scenes I've ever done in class was with her. And JJ left class. We hadn't seen each other in a while. We brought Kestrin on board to direct, and I texted this to JJ last night, um, but uh, Kestrin brought JJ on board to audition for the role of Carrie. Charlotte was going to play Cat, and then Charlotte got so jealous of the audition that JJ gave for Carrie that she went, screw that, I'm playing that part. <laughs> so I had to call JJ and be like, uh, so uh, change of plans, Charlotte's playing that role. Uh, screw it you want to play cat like i don't know what that read will be like on you but i think that'll be a hell of a lot of fun and jj was like "Ooh, that bitch i gotta watch out for her um <laughs> in very jj fashion she's very happy like that so then jj texted me was like can i bring on my friend my friend melissa to help with costumes and uh melissa has become a dear friend of mine i i she is i she sent me the first thing she sent me was cat in the hat and it was all these images of the cat character and all these crazy hats she wanted to put cat in. And I was like, oh my God, you get it. You get yeah. it. You She's get the it. mad catter. And the mad catter. Yes. Catter. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's just the fact that when cat pops up the first time, I think you can watch this movie sometimes and think she's a Tyler Durden, like, you're not real. Like, are you Lindsay's imaginary friend kind of thing is really, I, I just, yeah, Melissa did a, such a phenomenal yeah. job. And again, all gratitude to JJ for bringing on board and to Kestrin for bringing JJ back into my life. When she, I actually did, I, it had such an Alice in Wonderland vibe to me when I read it, but I never would have pictured the costume design the way that like, I, I just, that's not my brain. Um, but Melissa sent me some ideas for hats and I was like, wait, I'm the, I'm the mad hat, the mad catter. That's, that's exactly, I'm like bringing this, <laughs> this person into my, you know, magical Alice in Wonderland world. Um, was, and it was so much fun. I was going to say she picked up, uh, Melissa was so amazing about picking up on the details and this idea yeah. of unconscious things for the characters. She really wanted to work in the neckerchief that I am wearing when I show up to the house and my little put together, you know, made well outfit with my one bottle of wine and my neckerchief done just so. Um, at the end of the boutique scene, when Kat decides to save the day, when my boss is angry with me, she grabs this scarf off a display and walks off and says, I'm going to take care of this. And if anyone is, is really able to see that, that's the scarf that I'm wearing when I show up. And that was a Melissa moment. Those were the wonderful details that she added to make sure that there was a depth to all of the inspiration for what everybody was wearing. 
And Melissa couldn't come to set for, you know, three weeks in Northern California. So I drove um, on my costumes up. I can't remember. I, I, I'm sure I had other people's costumes too, but I drove uh, all of the costumes up in my trunk. And I was so nervous because the, my trunk was more expensive than my car, <laughs> but pro- the whole movie, every, <laughs> Because it was so like many pieces life insurance on lens. policy. It was like seven human carcasses worth of couture that she put in her car and brought yeah. to this house. <laughs> Neatly organized day by day. I like I rehearsed how I was gonna go through like scene by scene, like how the to time it appropriately because there were so many details. And I didn't want to hold up production and I was going to be, you know, like just like always going to be on a time budget. And um, I literally rehearsed going through all my costumes, all my wardrobe. And like, I tell them about your vape. Tell them about your vape. Oh, the <laughs> well, the vape was a little touch that got added in later on um, when uh, we were we were having our like first night, <laughs> um, our first night drinks and um and hanging out and I ain't like as JJ not as Cat ha- was wearing cowboy boots um and I had stuck my vape in my cowboy boots um because I was like you know we're gonna be drinking a lot I don't want to like I don't want to smoke but I might want to vape I stopped at a vape store on the way up to Northern California <laughs> and I put these vapes in my cowboy boot and I pulled it out when we were having drinks and Kester was like wait a second. Um, I think that you, I think that that's a new cat thing. I think that cat needs to be a vapor. Michael, can cat be a vapor? And we all kind of collectively agreed that cat could be a vapor. And then it turned into a whole other, it took on, it's it's a whole other story as, um, you know, with these matching vapes. And I think the vape budget got bigger and bigger. Yeah, well, she coordinated, <laughs> she coordinated every outfit with a different color vape. Yeah. How psycho is that? <laughs> Amazing. She she turned the vapes into an accessory that followed through every outfit throughout the film. I yeah. got the invoice request from our producer, Katya Alexander, that was like, wait, JJ's expensing vapes? And I was like, no, I'm in. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> you're paying for this. This is 100% happening. Let's go. <laughs> I love that. And I think it speaks overall to like the intricacy in which the comedy is weaved in so many different ways. It's about the lines of dialogue that the characters say, but also the details that we're seeing on screen, you know, kind of going back to that idea of how self-aware characters are at different points. You know, you really kind of blend into the comedy of those instances and just the, the references that some of these characters drop, like dropping like, oh, we, we, we make our own tequila, but it's only for consumption with complete deadpan. Um, and so I was interested in, for all of you, kind of how you found what the line of the comedy was and how far can we push some of those little absurdities into the comedic space before it starts to feel more like a caricature than a character, because it always feels like a character in this film. Thank you for saying that, by the way, because that was something we struggled with. We, you know, Michael has a really strong comedic tone when he writes. And then, you know, you have your story by writers getting in there and we were working on the female dialogue and we were, there was a lot of cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, in certain ways. And then when we got to set, we had these gorgeous costumes that Melissa gave us that were larger than life. And then we had the vape that's getting added. And then we have these amazing actors who can improv and and sparkles and sequins on couches and karaoke machines. And we thought, oh my God, like, are we making American pie? Are we, are we make? what are we doing? And it was really Kestrin who kept her eye on what we needed to rein in. When we could blow it out, we would get one really clean take of just the most grounded, <laughs> the most grounded version of the script. And then she'd say, okay, we got that. And then she would let people fly and weird moments would pop in and things would get bigger. But I think at the same time, all the actors felt that they understood the person that they were playing. It was not about portraying an idea. It was about really making sure that they knew what they wanted and why they were there and what was going on. So it was this great combination of a wonderful cast and also a really smart dynamic director who kept her eye on the style. And then I think ultimately we did a lot of edits of this film and she was also the curator of what got pulled from which moment so that it really did feel like a complete meal at the end of the day, rather than just one flavor. So we got to keep some of the bigger moments and then we got to, you know, make sure that there was some grounding in there too. 
I always approach every actor as the specialist in their character. And to the delegation point, I, I purely, I a hundred percent delegate their character and they are the specialist in, in, in that work and that's their job. And I generally feel like it's my job to listen to what they have to say about it. And if there is pushback and sometimes there is, if they keep pushing and fighting, then I'll let them win. You know, it's like, it's, it's usually like all those conversations, like sometimes like there, there were a few times it was a little bit, I was like, I don't know how this is going to cut together. And I would bark like, let's be a little more civilized people, just a little <laughs> bit, just like a scotch more civilized. Um, Wait, so but, you're saying you know, if I fought you harder, I could have gotten away with more shit. That's what I deserve. <laughs> well, maybe. Damn it. Damn it. I don't know though. I don't know. With you, it's different. I feel like you and I have a different relationship because I acted in, in a, I starred in a movie that I directed. So I uniquely understand the battle it is to write and be the lead in your own movie and the unique traps of it. So I think I projected my own personality onto Michael in a way that um, was just trying to avoid, or, or just like recognizing these like familiar, like brain loops that we got into. I might need to jump off in a little in a, in one sec, but uh, Kestrin, yes. uh, as Kestrin is leaving, let's get that clean. Say bye, Kestrin. Uh, yes. All right. Well, yes. I, I'm I about felt to like... compliment you in a big way, though. About to say a really nice oh. thing about you. Um, okay. Which Kestrin pulled me aside day two of shooting and was like, "I've done this before." She's like, "I'm watching you watch other people say your words." She's like, <laughs> "And." you're not concentrating on you and I need you to concentrate on you and I need you to concentrate on Jack. And I, Kestrin has been a, like a Kestrin and Britt have been Sherpas for me and over the last through obviously through production, but over the last six months through post um, Kestrin was just, I, I loved that she would come to set every day and she would do this thing with us where she'd be like, I just got this scene. And I'd be like, what? You've had the script for a year. What do you mean you don't get the scene? Oh my God. Oh my God. It's screwed. This is screwed. This is screwed. And then we would do a couple of runs of it. And then I'd be like, oh, you motherfucker. You were just trying to fucking get us into it because you didn't want us to come up with our rehearsed shit. Um, she really, she really created such a beautiful environment for us to just play and have so much fun. We Britt and I were talking about this um a week or two ago, but um, I was having this moment on set where we were shooting stuff with Britt and I in the bedroom specifically. Those are the first two days, Britt, three days. Yeah, we shot out all the bedroom stuff in two days. Two before days. Before everybody else got up there. Before, before of indie filmmaking. Out. Yeah, we were trying to save money. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I was like, oh, shh. Did I, did I write Revolutionary Road? I didn't mean to write like a really intense drama. Oh my God. And then everybody else came up and I was, and Britt just mentioned this, but I was like, okay, I didn't mean to make American pie. Oh God, what did I make? Um, and Kestrin just did such a phenomenal job um, with our editor, Grant Naliche of um, threading the needle of finding those really lovely emotional moments and those really like ouch moments. Um, but also like letting actors like JJ specifically, who's a revelation in this, um, just play and have fun and, and be weird. And like, I'm about weird comedy. I love it. I like absurdity. And it's also a smart director who lets you get multiple takes. You know, there was never this idea that there was a, perf a perfection that we were trying to achieve in one direction. She would really say, okay, great. Now we did that. Now do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. So we got different takes tonally so that in the editing room, long after everybody is home and again, with indie filmmaking, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of resources. We can't just schedule a reshoot and get back to this location. You know, if we're in there and we're seeing that the puzzle pieces don't fit. So we had a lot to choose from and we did test screenings, you know, for about a week and a half, night after night after night with different people. This isn't working, this isn't working. What are the trends? Okay, let's pop this in, let's try this. And we had all of those pieces because she had been so wise to make sure that we had gotten them on set. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you feel like it was balanced throughout because that was something that we were really unsure about until you, until you get to that last moment where you finally literally have to let go and send the file. You know, there's that, that, uh, did we get it? Did we not? Should we have added just one more moment of this? Did it need to breathe one more second? You know, so I'm glad that it resonated for you. 
It did. And it, it absolutely lands in that space. And it's so great to hear kind of all about those conversations behind the scenes and all, all of the rest of the details that went into making this film. Congratulations on the premiere at South by Southwest. And thank you so much for talking about the film with us. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Mom. Nice to meet you.